Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Jeff Keppel. We're just gonna hang on for another minute or two before we get started. Welcome. Welcome everybody. I, I really wish we were doing this live. Um, well, doing this, excuse me, together in person. <laughs> uh, this is live um, for many reasons. For one, um, I'm really glad you didn't get to see the last hour of some last minute technical glitches that we're having. Um, so it's a real test um, of Dr. Dieter and I to keep our composure as well as Jenny in the background there, but we, we really hope that we can pull this off. Um, it, we're finding that that on different computers, including you know Macs versus PCs, there are some interesting challenges, but hopefully you're hearing me. I'm loud and clear. Uh, Dr. Dieter, are you hearing me loud and clear? I can. Sounds perfect. Oh, okay, sounds good. Well, welcome to what we hope to be um, one of many of our NorCal virtual lectures in our conference series. Um, we will likely be doing this uh, type of format once every quarter, and we hope it's a success. Like many things in the future, we're hoping that uh, we'll be talking about other things besides COVID and that we will probably end up having a hybrid of virtual events from NorCal as well as in-person uh, conferences, which we think are still incredibly important to, to see one another in formats other than this, where our screens are flashing at us and we don't get to hear people laughing and, and joking when we make a joke. So um, first of all, um, I want you to know that um, this is a free CE. And so it's our goal to have this be something that you can then add to um, two 50-minute sessions on our website and create a three-unit CE bundle. Um, I am actually going to read how to get your CE, so the bundle is not something that we have ready yet, but that is our plan for the future, to have three CE unit bundles. But at the end of the event today, you will be provided a link in the chat section of your screen, and you click on the link and it will take you to a document that you will need to complete in order to process your CE certificate. Um, bottom line, uh, if you don't really you know, know how to go through it and, and do the steps, call um, Kathy Van Don and she can walk through it at NorCal or email her. But I don't want to take a lot of time on that today. So um, next, I want to make sure that I just thank um, our sponsors, PHI Air Medical, Sac Valley MedShare, uh, Banner Bank. I also like to thank our NorCal organization, Jenny, um, Jenny McGuire, Bill Bogan Reef um, for helping put this together. Um, so uh, with that, I want to introduce Dr. Dieter. Um, Dr. Dieter is a pediatric intensivist practicing in Reno, Nevada. She is the medical director of the PICU and inpatient pediatric renowned children's. Uh, she's in, in affiliation with University of Nevada, Reno. She also serves as associate professor and division chief of pediatric critical care. She's also the chief of pediatrics for renowned regional medical center. Uh, she grew up in Reading, uh, completed her undergraduate studies at the University of California, Berkeley. She completed pediatric residency in San Antonio, Texas. She practiced general pediatrics, urgent care. Uh, she led a hospitalist group. And then she couldn't uh, get enough of all this education and training. And then she went back and uh, did a pediatric critical care fellowship at Seattle Children's Hospital in 2009. And then she worked in a large um, cardiac, CI, cardiac ICU and peds ICU in South Florida. Moved back to Renown and uh, we're glad to have her. She's been back in Reno since 2016. Um, she's employed by RIMSA to provide pediatric training to Northern Nevada's paramedic fire and care flight teams. Chris is married to a trauma surgeon, so one question I'll have for her is, I hope you and your husband talk about more things than medicine <laughs> at home. Um, and then I just found out on this bio today, I, I know Chris a little bit, but she's an avid skier, biker, hiker, and pickleball player. And um, Dr. Dieter, I just built a pickleball court at my house. so. We're going to have to have you over and play pickleball when it warms up a bit. So okay. with that, I'd like to pre present Dr. Dieter. Thank you so much, Dr. Keppel. Um, that's a fantastic introduction and more than I would ever say about myself. I do love pickleball and we are still getting out on the court and we have a nice day here like it is today in the 50s. We're out there playing. So 
I just want to say thank you to everybody who's tuned in today and thank you so much for everything you do. Um, I absolutely appreciate how hard the work can be some days, how good it can be some days and uh, how rough of a year it's been. So this is my one year anniversary of getting ready for this talk. Dr. Keppel asked me to present this at our conference that was scheduled for April 4th. I believe it was in Reading and I was so excited to come home to Reading. I haven't been there very much since my high school graduation. Go Wolves, Shasta High. But um, life changed, the year changed, and we're all hanging in there. And so thank you for inviting me virtually to give this talk. Today I'm going to be talking about bad things happening to kids and just giving you some tips and pearls and my ideas of how we can do a little bit better in taking care of, of the kids. And I do encourage you if you want to jump in on the chat. I can't see the chat. I can't see myself right now. I can just see my PowerPoint. But if you jump in, ask questions, if I'm speaking too quickly, too slowly, um, if you have just anything to ask, jump in on the chat and Dr. Keppel will interrupt me. And I'm happy to have it that way, like a live version or an in-person version. I'm happy to answer any of your questions. So as he noted, I am employed by many different people. My Mednax National Medical Group, UNR, Renown, and most proudly REMSA. I do all their care flight teaching, paramedic fire. I go out to Story Lyon counties. I was just up in Incline Village as much as possible, spreading the love, pediatric love, talking about how to get a little more comfortable taking care of kids in the field. So I really appreciate the opportunity to give this talk. I'm going to skip through this a little bit. What I'm going to talk about today is pediatric injury and more specifically preventable pediatric injury. Preventable injury claims the lives of 28 kids per day. So it's the number one killer of children in the United States. And a lot of people don't realize that. Preventable injury, in my definition, is something that absolutely does not need to happen if adults are involved in doing the right things to protect children. So when I think about this, I think about the statistic that if we take a school bus, and a school bus holds about 72 children, in the course of a week, the epidemic of preventable injury claims three school buses full of children in one week. So how fast would we all activate and how aggressive would we be if we knew that we were losing 150 school buses full of children every year? This is how many kids we do lose to preventable injury and we need to do more to prevent this from happening. There's a publicly available document updated every year by the CDC that shows the 10 leading causes of death for every age group in the United States. And I need to update this slide probably, but in 2017, this is what it looked like. And I'm gonna drill down a little bit to our pediatric population. So looking at the age across the top, that's less than one year olds, one to four, five to nine, 10 to 14, and then 15 to 24 year olds. <laughs> And then the rank of what the leading cause of death is. If you look at those blue boxes, that's unintentional injury. So it's not strokes and heart attacks that kill children, it's injury. It's an alarming and timely topic. Um, after years of decreasing mortality, we're now seeing an acute rise in deaths in adolescents. So this is just um, teens from 10 to 19 years of age. If you look back at 1999, um, we've done all these great things, airbags, seatbelts, mothers against drunk driving, and we decrease the rate of unintentional injury. But if you look at 2014 and moving forward, that number is starting to tick up a little bit. And if you break this down, a lot of this is motor, motor vehicle traffic. And the big thing, as you all know, is texting. We think that's what's affecting this number going back up after all the good work that we've done. If you look at the total number of um, fatalities from ages zero to 19, again, most of it is unintentional car accidents. And there's not too, too much we can do about that other than the safety measures we have in place and teaching people not to text and to be aware, making sure they have appropriate training. Under that is homicide and suicide injury, which are not considered preventable injury. Those are intentional injuries, so they don't show up in the other chart. And then we have some other things going on down here. Drownings has been a big focus of mine. Um, Jody Miller and Nicole and John Hughes, if you've heard of either of those two families, uh, had two high pro profile drownings a couple years ago, and they've been out there talking a lot about child drownings. And again, we were doing a really good job from the 1980s on down, decreasing drowning rate in children age 14 and younger. 
And then again, if you look at this, I broke this down a little bit. So the top dark blue line is age zero to four years. Drowning is actually the number one cause of death in that age group, in the zero to four year age group. And if you look, we were doing really well. American Academy of Pediatrics was promoting safety and, and decreasing drowning rates. But then again, at the very end of that graph, 2015, 2017, including till now, the numbers are going back up. The numbers of drownings that we're seeing are going back up and the mortality is going back up. So this is the part that concerns us. Drowning isn't you know, high on the list. So if you look at this pediatric report, the American College of Surgeons puts this out. And this is the number one at the top falls, of course, is the number one thing that happens. It's the incidence of injury. So falls are still number one and motor vehicle accidents. You know, drowning doesn't hit until the bottom. But if you look at the case fatality rate, so that number on the very far right, that's the percentage of those accidents that result in a death. And if you look at falls and MVAs, that's not a big percentage. One to three percent of kids will die in those accidents. But if you go down to drowning and submersion, that's somewhere we need to focus. We've got a 30 percent mortality rate when you look at those injuries. And the same right above it, suffocation is usually our SIDS cases, our little kids that die of SIDS. In California, to talk about your state specifically, um, the place that most kids are drowning is swimming pools. And I, I thought it would be the ocean, but it's mostly swimming pools. So that's, again, a place that we absolutely need to look at and focus and make sure that we're doing the right thing for kids with our swimming pools. Some of the things we've talked about, and you know better than I, hopefully you're talking to your friends about, our pool covers, fences and alarms, um, reducing pool alco alcohol use, poolside alcohol use. Um, large crowds are a problem. I'll tell you that most of the drownings that I get in Reno come from the GSR, come from the casinos, the Atlantis. There's a big pool out there. There's a lot of people hanging out. Everybody thinks somebody's watching the kids. There's all these floaties in the pool. And next thing you know, somebody realizes that there's a child down in the pool and pulls them out. So it's real important to be careful, even more careful with large parties and large crowds. Bystanders need to be trained in CPR, so we're doing our best to increase those numbers. Swim lessons are absolutely important. We're going to get back to that. Having lifeguards, telephones at the poolside, and not encouraging the use of floaties. These are just, you know, death instruments in my, in my, in my book. Pool fences, let's start with that really quick. So when you're going to buy a house and you're looking at these houses, that's a beautiful house, right? It's not the house you want to buy. And that's a gorgeous pool, but there's something really wrong with that pool. This is the house that we want to buy, and this is the fence that we want to have up. So just by putting a fence around the pool, we know that we can decrease the rate of childhood drowning drastically. Um, it should be separate from the house. The pool fence should be separate from the house, not so the kids can walk out to the slider into the pool with a fence around it. Um, and toys should also be removed. If you look at this little guy, he's obviously looking at that floaty across the pool, and he's probably going to do anything he can to get over to it. Backyard fun. These are not my favorite items either. I've resuscitated a few kids who have drowned in backyard pools. These soft-sided um, pools, first of all, I just think of them as a giant bacteria pool. Um, they tend to sit out in our backyards. We don't always refill them or clean them. They can be left filled for weeks at a time. There's obviously no fence around them. So not just your kids, but your neighbor's kids can get into them. And then the biggest problem is the sides are soft. And so if a kid tries to climb into that pool, they could sink into the soft side. Next thing you know, their face is in the water and there's nothing you can do about it. And they're not strong enough to get out. So I highly discourage these items unless you're blowing them up briefly and taking them back down. And then those little hamster balls, if anybody's seen those at the state fair, those are my least favorite items. They basically put a kid in there, seal them up, set a timer, and hopefully in 10 minutes they pull them out before they pass out. Uh, the problem is without air, those kids are going down pretty fast and nobody's paying attention. So not my favorite toy at the state fair. Swim lessons. So the American Academy of Pediatrics has long held a position that children are not developmentally ready for swimming lessons until they turn four years of age. Just so you know, um, the update for that is that the American Academy of Peds just a couple years ago finally changed that to over one year of age. There's been um, no increased risk of drowning shown in children who received lessons and actually a decreased risk over one year of age. So the American Academy is now recommending that any child over one year of age 
go ahead and get swim lessons. Um, drowning victims were much less likely to have had swim lessons. So when they did actually studied this, 26% of drowning lesson victims had not had swim lessons and 3% had swim lessons. So we've actually studied it. It does show um, a good benefit to teach your kid how to swim. Still not encouraging the little babies to be under there. There's lots of baby swim classes. American Academy of Peds is not a big fan of that still. When we talk about drowning definitions, um, I talk about um, vocabulary a lot in my classes. So what are real words and what are not real words? These are the real words when we talk about drowning. Um, you can have a fatal drowning or a non-fatal drowning. And if it's a non-fatal drowning, if you do not die in that injury, it can be a non-fatal drowning with injury or illness, so basically with neurological damage usually, or a non-fatal drowning without injury or illness. And that's it. Those are the words. Those are the only words you should use when you talk about a drowning. There's some other made up words. So near drowning is actually not a medical term that we should be using. You don't near drown. You either drowned or you didn't. It was fatal or non-fatal. And then secondary drowning and dry drowning are also made up words that have hit the media um, in the recent years. Dry drowning, I don't know how many of you saw this, but it was kind of blown up a few years ago. It was all over talk shows. Um, there was a mom who reported that her child in Texas was sitting on the couch days after swimming and died of drowning. And unfortunately, her doctor backed that up and it, it wasn't a true story. Dry drowning does not happen. You don't have to be afraid. You know, we created more fear in parents than they've ever had. They have enough reasons to be scared and they didn't need this one. Um, but dry drowning was thought to be, you know, your kids in the swimming pool, maybe get some air in their lungs, you don't realize it, and a few days later they can actually die um, of this dry drowning problem. Um, as we know, this is not a real thing, so I'm just pointing it out in case you hear about it. Um, you can aspirate fluid while you're, while you're in the pool. You can actually suck down some water into your lungs. That can turn into a pneumonitis, that can turn into a pneumonia, but that child is not going to look well in between um, presentation and it, in between the drowning event or the choking event and, and presentation for further help. They'll be wheezing, tachypnic. If they're developing a pneumonia, they're going to be sick. So you want to look for those things if your child does choke or has an aspiration event in the pool, but they're not going to be sitting on the couch and suddenly die of drowning. So for Drowning and for all the preventable injuries, we have our pre-hospital system set up and you guys do an amazing job at getting to the scene and resuscitating patients. We want everybody to have their PALS certification. So if you don't, I encourage you to do that. Your pediatric advanced life support certification, super, super important. Um, that'll help you feel more comfortable, at least taking care of kids. And the more times you take that class or research, hopefully you're gonna feel a little bit more comfortable. And then there's an entire you know, emergency medical services for children um, curriculum and literature and studies that take place. This is my team, Rimsa. Carefully. Um, we, so that you go out to resuscitate the kid, um, the one things I want you to think about is if there is a diving or assault involved, just make sure you put a C collar on and go ahead and put them on a backboard. I'm not a big fan, I'll get back to this, um, of those two things. But if you think that there's been a dive into a shallow lake, a dive off a pier, a dive into a swimming pool that there could be a C-spine injury, just make sure to protect um, those areas in the pre-hospital environment. Once you get to the hospital, I can just give you a quick rundown of basic things that are going to happen. We, we want to do the same things you're going to do in the field. We're going to avoid hypoxia, so you really want to make sure they have enough oxygen going into their system and their pulse ox looks pretty good. You want to avoid hypercarbia, so you don't want that PCO2 to climb over 40 if possible. And that's for neuroprotection more than anything. Avoid hypotension, so know your pediatric uh, minimum systolic for age, calculate that, get your Braslow card out and keep their blood pressure above that. And you might need to do that with bolus fluids. And then we're going to avoid hyperglycemia. So we're gonna do the same things in the ICU that you're doing on the field. The biggest things that I think we can improve in the field are keeping the head of the bed up. So most of the time you're rolling into the ED on a flat stretcher. I would just encourage you if there's been a neurologic injury in any way or the patient's been down from drowning, to keep the head of the bed up, 30 to 45 degrees even. Keep the head midline. Again, I'm not big on sea collars, but I like to wrap a towel around the neck at least to keep the head forward. Kids easily pinch off their jugular vein or even carotid if you have pressure on 
the side of their neck with a seat collar or if their head is falling over to the side. So just remember to keep that head midline straight and elevated. You want to ensure adequate blood pressure, oxygenation, sedation if needed. And then we're going to start working on ARDS strategies once they hit the ICU. And that's all done with the ventilator. There are some things we've tried in the past for drowning. We thought would be the magic bullet, giving them back surfactant so their lungs don't stick together, or giving them steroids so it decreases inflammation. We've studied those things up and down. It actually has not been proven to be a benefit. One thing I want to talk to you guys about is um, I get a lot of feedback from paramedics after they bring in a child and they want to know how the child's doing, and they take it very personally if the child's not doing well. And I just want to take a little bit of that burden away from you and explain um, outcomes of drowning a little bit. The way I think about it, if you get to the field, if you get to that child in the field and they're down as a drowning event and you can provide CPR immediately and you get some response in the field, eye opening, vomiting, hold, you know, squeezing a hand, anything, then that kid's probably going to do pretty well. I just want to tell you that right off the bat. If there is no neurologic improvement or change from the pool side to the ER, most likely they are going to have a, what I call a tragically poor prognosis. Most likely they are not going to survive that injury. And it's, it's I hate to say it, but it's almost as straightforward as that. So we know that submersion injury can have a poor prognosis, but we typically resuscitate very early and aggressively. We wanna ensure survival of those who might, who might potentially have a good outcome. So you're gonna do all the right things in the field. You're absolutely gonna resuscitate that patient, do everything you can to get a pulse back, give some epi, whatever you need to do and bring that child in. But just know that sometimes when we're resuscitating these patients, we're actually resuscitating patients that are going to end up in a persistent vegetative state. And it's a really tough call. It's not your call to make. It's a really tough call to decide if we continue resuscitations um, or not, knowing, knowing that um, this is potentially the outcome. The only predictor I've ever found that makes any sense to me or that's been shown in any type of research to correlate with prognosis and survival is this old thing called the Orlowski score. And Dr. Keppel might know this. Um, it's way back from like the 1970s, 1974, I believe, Orlowski came up with a scoring system. And, you know, it's not that academic, not, you know, not many people really believe in the score, but I really find that it gives me an idea of how I think they're going to do. I think it actually lands, it lands pretty strong. There's one point given for each item on this scoring system. And basically, like I said, the way it works is there's not a lot of middle ground. There's bad prognosis and good prognosis. So if you get one or two points on the score that I'll show you, if you score one or two points, there's a 90% likelihood that you're going to fully recover from this drowning event. As soon as you get that third point on the score, there's a less than 5% chance of survival. So again, pretty black and white, not a lot of middle ground. And this is what you get points for. Age less than three years, that's a point, unfortunately. Submersion time greater than five minutes. No resuscitative efforts made for more than 10 minutes after rescue if they're comatose on admission to the ER, and what I mean is a GCS of three, basically, or 3T. So if they hit the ER and they still haven't done any of those things I was talking about, you've seen no recovery at all, that gives them a point. And an arterial pH on arrival of less, or even in the field, of less than 7.1. So what we know from studying the Orlovsky score, again, it hasn't been looked at recently, but I still really like it. Um, if you get two points on this list, then you have a pretty good chance of survival. As soon as you have a third point, you have a greater than 90% chance of mortality. I'm bringing that up just because, um, again, paramedics and EMTs try to tend to take things pretty personally. Just know you're going to do everything you can for that child, but sometimes the prognosis is out of your hands and sometimes the damage has already been done. And I, again, I urge you to do your best, but you know, know that there's really poor outcomes when it comes to drowning and when they've been down for a while. Now, the challenges of pediatric trauma as we get a little bit away from drowning more into trauma, you know, we know that not everyone's a fan of taking care of children. If we were in a live audience, I'd have you raise your hands and tell me how you feel about taking care of kids. And a lot of you don't like it, and I get that. Um, but we need good people to help us out in the field, and you need to feel comfortable and confident. So I always tell people, you know, take all your ACLS, take all your basic training, and keep it in your brain. Don't let it fall out when you see a kid. You use all of that training. ACLS is almost the same as PALS. Use all that training to do the same things for a child that you would for an adult. And if you keep that in mind, keep yourself calm and take a big deep breath, 
and just do what you can for that kid, you're probably going to have a good outcome by doing it that way and not being scared. Don't let yourself black out when you see a kid. So that's one of the challenges in pediatric trauma is that we just don't have a lot of people out there that really know what they're doing with kids and that aren't scared of kids. Um, the other problem is when we teach pediatric advanced life support or PALS, we know that pediatric skills deteriorate quickly because you're not picking up the volume of children that you pick up as adults. So it's really important to get your continuing education and to recertify because just because you learned it once, you're just not getting enough practice in the field to get really good at it without those recertification classes. Now, um, pediatric trauma is um, a really big illness and injury that we don't put enough money toward or training toward or attention toward, unfortunately. Uh, the Childress Institute is actually run by Randy Childress, so NASCAR, if anybody's a big NASCAR fan, and he set up this Childress Institute to, to make people more aware of the damage done and the um, impact it has on our country. So if you look at the left side, the federal research dollars, what's spent on cancer, diabetes, and heart disease is way beyond what we spend on childhood injury, unfortunately. We know that a child dies from injury every hour. Um, there's at least, and this is an older slide, 9,500, let's say 10,000 kids are dying every year from traumatic injury. Um, one in four children, so that's one in four of our children, will sustain an unintentional injury. Um, kids actually make up about 27% of all ED visits. The problem is only 6% of emergency departments in the United States, when fully surveyed, had all of the supplies deemed essential for managing a pediatric emergency. So even though one out of three patients walking out the door is a kid, most EDs do not have the equipment available to take care of them. And then the other big problem is that about 17 to 18 million children live further than 60 minutes from a pediatric trauma center. So and that's most of you in Northern California. I know, um, I was there and that's a lot of us in Nevada too. So that's when it gets scary because you know you're gonna be showing up at a community ED and they might not have everything that they need. So foundations like the Children's Institute are really pushing to change that and pushing to put the materials and supplies and the training in the hands of the community EDs and into the population of the small towns. This is actually run by Bob Geffler, this foundation, just so you know. Um, he lost his youngest son in 2008 from a TBI from a football injury. So he's really invested in the um, pediatric trauma awareness campaign. We know that survival goes up by 25% when children are treated at a pediatric trauma center. The problem is we just can't have them everywhere. There's just not enough kids in, in certain areas to have a pediatric trauma center. I'll throw out some numbers for you. We know that if you have a, a community of greater than 500,000, then that's probably big enough to have a children's hospital. So if you look around the Northern California area, um, you might not have enough at this point to actually have a children's hospital and to have a pediatric trauma center, you really have to have a children's hospital. So unfortunately, you know, we'll get back to this again at the end, um, they're gonna be a little bit further away for you. So we don't have MVAs, I'm sorry, we don't have as many MVAs and seatbelt problems and traumas. So what's getting these kids into trouble? I'll just show you what keeps me in business. You two. One, two, three. Oh, oh. Oh. Did you act? Last one was actually Reno. Super proud of that. Um, so pediatric trauma is going to keep happening even if we make the cars safer and we do self-driving cars and all these things. We still have a lot of kids out there getting into trouble. I want to detour a little bit and talk a little bit about dogma really quickly. And dogma is what we're taught to accept as true even though there's no research to support it. So like I told you, I'm big on vocabulary. I'm also very big on studies and evidence. So if you look back at our history as medical providers, you know, there's there's a lot of dogma back there. There's a lot of things that we were taught were a good idea, but then when we actually researched them, they weren't. So from the oldest to the newest, you used to bloodlet, you know, bloodletting was awesome. Lobotomies, just take out their brain, that'll make them better. If any of you are older, uh, my age, you'll know the mass suit. You remember the mass suits? We used to wrap patients up in these giant inflatable devices. 
Um, very Pulp Fiction, we used to give intracardiac epi, sounded like a good idea at the time, not so much, uh, maybe not a good idea, haven't done that in a long time. Um, fluids and trauma, now we're getting more recent. So if you had a penetrating trauma patient in the field, you put an IV in them just like everybody else and start giving them boluses. Well, Ken Maddox at Ben Taub in Houston, Texas really rallied for this one for years. We go to conferences, everybody said he was crazy. He said, do not do this. Do not give these patients big boluses of fluid. This is the wrong thing to do. You're just diluting their hemoglobin. It took 30, 40 years. I don't even know for anyone to listen to him. And now he's one of the most revered um, trauma surgeons out there. And it turns out he was right. They studied it and you shouldn't give big bolus, boluses and penetrating trauma with blood loss. What the patient needs is blood. So again, seemed like a good idea at the time, but as we research and we learn, we move away from it. The last three things are kind of on the table right now, pretty controversial. So spine boards, um, hard C collars, and early goal-directed therapies are things we've been taught are good, but maybe we need to start moving away from them. So those things are called dogma, like I said, and the hot topics around trauma have to do with those items. So starting with pre-hospital resuscitation and doing it right, uh, it's as I said, when you see a kid, don't let all the stuff fall out of your head. You do the same thing for this kid as you're going to do for the adult. You're going to start with airway. You're going to move through airway. You can look at their breathing, make sure they're getting air in and out, look at their pulse ox, look at the quality of the breathing and decide are they having a primary respiratory problem or a primary cardiac problem. You're going to move on to circulation. You're going to get some IVs in. You're going to check their perfusion, their pulses, the same thing you're doing for adults. The only thing different here is you want to know that this baby on this page has a different systolic blood pressure than an adult. And so you have to know how to calculate that. And again, I'm not going to go into all the details of PALS. I would love to teach you in PALS or um, share a class with you someday, but basically calculating that 70 plus the age times two if they're one to 10 years of age. So again, 70 plus the age times two if they're one to 10 years of age. Over 10, use your adult scales. Over 10, their minimal, minimal, minimum systolic blood pressure is 90, just like an adult. Under one, anywhere between 60 and 70 seems to do the trick. So maintain that minimum blood pressure. Don't let them get hypotensive. And again, more rare in kids to be hypotensive. Don't wait for that. If they're tachycardic and they don't look good, they're probably going into shock. And they're probably stressed. Don't wait for the hypotension. kids wait until the very end before they drop their blood pressure. So that's another difference with kids. With disability, stop the bleeding, splint the extremities, um, make sure that um, they don't have any neuro issues. When I teach PALS, I, the D for me is the brain. So make sure you look at their pupils, make sure this is an abuse patient, make sure their fontanelle is bulging. We'll get back to that in a second. Exposure, keeping the patient warm. And then again, the new thing that's coming up with pre-hospital priorities is what I'm adding to this list as your F. If you haven't heard of F yet, it's fast to the ED or potentially the operating room if they're penetrating trauma. Um, I haven't heard what's happened with it yet, but there's a big study being done in Philadelphia where they now have two arms for EMS. If they go out and there's a big penetrating trauma in the field, they're actually resuscitating, resuscitating that trauma patient in the field as they normally do, but half of that group is going straight to the elevator at the hospital and straight to the operating room and the other half is doing the traditional route through the ER. And what we're finding, and we haven't proved it yet, so stay tuned, is that the group that goes straight to the OR is probably getting the best care and having um, decreased morbidity and mortality. But that group in Philadelphia is going to look at that and prove that for us. The biggest thing for me, keep calm and control the situation. So when you're out there in the field, especially if it's a kid, remember that mom is staring at you. And if you look stressed, she's going to be stressed. And it's going to be a tragic situation for you trying to deal with that kid in the field. So I very much encourage you to do whatever you can. Put on your poker face. Keep smiling. Stay calm. You don't have to smile. But stay calm and look like you're under in complete total control of the situation. Because if you start to look like you don't know what you're doing, that mom's going to pick up on it really fast or dad or sister or who's ever there, grandma. And they're not going to let you do your job. So I just encourage you to keep calm, carry on. The C-spine controversy is my favorite picture in my slides. Um, we don't know if this is a good thing or not. We're doing a lot of studies about C-spines now um, and injuries. There are some patients, yes, you want to put a hard color on. There are other patients that it absolutely does not benefit. So we're going to have to continue to look at this, do some more research on this, and it might not be, uh, it might not be 
protocol at some point to put a C spine or C collar on everybody and a backboard. Backboards are super uncomfortable. If you have a drunk patient, you know this, they're going to want to roll off of that spine board. Um, and kids especially do not do not like to be on that backboard. So we might start getting away from these things. But remember, skiers often have C-spine injuries. Snowboarders have lumbar spine injuries. You still want to use these this protection in the appropriate situation, but maybe not with everybody. We'll get back to that. Skiwara is what scares us about children. If you haven't heard of the word skiwara before, spinal cord injury without radiologic abnormality. So we call it skiwara. And basically what we found, um, we started studying this in the 80s. Um, we would see these kids and we do imaging on them. They look fine. We take them out of their seat collar, take them off their backboard. And the next day, the day after, all of a sudden they had neurologic damage. They weren't moving their legs, weren't moving their feet. So this was, this got this um, term ski war to attach to it. And it's basically made everybody very paranoid about children wanting to put them in seat collars or leave them in seat collars even more. It's more common to have a C-spine injury in the pediatric population due to the flexibility of their spine and ligaments. It's about six to 19% of all spinal injuries actually do not show anything on x-ray. So they won't have a fractured um, vertebrae there. You won't see anything the step off, but they've got ligament damage and that can lead to some serious neurological injury if they're allowed to move their necks around and everywhere. We know that 50% of young children with high spinal cord injuries, so open C2, C3 or so, have no fractures at all. What's changed these numbers for us and decreased the rate of skiwara is MRI. So you'll see us doing a lot more MRI on patients, a lot more MRIs of the neck. Um, MRI is now detecting about two thirds of injuries that we previously missed. So we're feeling a little more comfortable now getting kids out of C collars. So ER resuscitation for kids has vastly improved over the last few years, and that's because of these Braslow carts. So I hope you have one wherever you end up um, landing your, your kids, um, get them off the rig. You should turn around and see that Braslow cart, hopefully. If not, push your community EDs to buy one of these. It's totally worth it. You've got your Braslow card and your, you know, your, uh, your Braslow um, card to estimate in the field. You open that thing up, you lay it out, red to head, put the red arrow to the top of the head, and you can get an idea of how much they weigh and everything that you need is listed on that card. This matches up, that card matches up with this cart that you can have in the ED. So all of those same colors on your Braslow card are also here in this cart. And yes, they're expensive, but again, believe me, they're worth it. You don't wanna be struggling in the ED trying to find the right equipment. It's all right here for you. So when you roll that kit in, that ED should be able to grab that cart and hopefully have everything they need to resuscitate them. Remember that it's kilograms on the card, not pounds. And if all else fails and you don't have a card, ask mom. She's going to tell you how much your kid weighs and you can trust her from that. But we now with these cards um, triage patients in the ED more efficiently. At least at Renown, we have a trauma system, trauma red, trauma yellow, trauma green. I'm not sure what you guys have, but they get activated based on their level of trauma and then the difference in the color is basically how fast the trauma surgeon responds to the trauma. And then hopefully that trauma surgeon has some um, experience in, um, sorry, got that. has some experience in, in pediatric trauma um, and will be able to resuscitate and take care of that child appropriately. Access, huge issue for pediatrics. And we talk about hot topics. So, you know, has anyone ever tried to get an IV in a clamp down cold baby? I always, uh, I always kind of laugh, you know, a lot of my peds nurses are so proud of themselves, they'll throw a 24 gauge in the pinky of a baby. And that's awesome. I think they're amazing. But the problem is I can't really bolus that 24 gauge. So I ask you to think about your options as you move forward. If your child is down or you're resuscitating, um, and definitely if you're in cardiac arrest. So now Pal says cardiac arrest, don't even try for the IV. You're not going to get it. Go straight to your IO. Any child under 40 kilos gets that pink IO needle. So it's not a neonatal needle. It's 40 kilos and below, and that's going to take you to about your eight to 10 year old patient. You're going to be able to use that pink IO. So again, I'd love to spend an hour teaching you how to do good IO, but know how to do it, train to do it, practice doing it. If you are trying for an IV and the kid is in pretty bad shape, remember you have two attempts, 90 seconds, two providers. If you're needing anything more than that, please don't fuss around. Um, I'm more and more just going straight to the IO. Uh, if it's 
If you are doing it, remember to use your unex uninjured extremity, just like in the adults. And proximal humerus is actually the best place to place it. Plus, best place to place it. Um, the tibia is the easiest, so go for it if, if you need to get it in there. Um, but if you can practice your proximal humerus skills, just look at the pictures, know where the growth plates are in kids, and put it in the right place. There's also some venous cut down spots. So these are the places that we're looking for when we really need to do a venous cut down. Um, my places for central venous lines um, are all located in that, in that picture there. But remember that central lines aren't always easy. I just poked away at a little 11 week old the other day and couldn't get it. So it's not your end all be, be all to get a central line. Again, don't wait for it. Um, don't delay care, get your IO in. Um, and if it falls out, get the IO in the other leg as quick as you can. You can practice with chicken thighs, by the way, and chicken bones. I tend to bring those things up to ER groups and just practice um, in somebody's house with a glass of wine. Drill a, drill a chicken thigh, drill, you know, get some ribs, practice putting them in bones. It's kind of fun. All right, moving on past pre-hospital resuscitation. So stop the bleed. We've really started working on this program. I hope you've all either seen the class or heard of it or teach it, hopefully. This is all about tourniquet use. Um, and then we moved into uh, massive transfusion protocols. The program is actually really important. It came out of the Boston Marathon. And if you didn't see this commercial, here you go. You've probably seen these boxes on our set. They're bleeding control kits. And they're part of a new White House initiative. Soon, you'll be seeing them on the walls of public spaces. Airports, shopping malls, even your place of business. Open the box and you will find what you need to stave off a bleeding wound. And give the victim time for help to arrive. These are items that you should also have in your home and car. The kit comes with gauze, scissors, and a tourniquet. As well as gloves to protect you and the patient. Often holding pressure firmly against a wound or wrapping it tightly will stop the bleeding. But in more severe cases, a tourniquet may be required. It should be slipped on the limb and fastened above the bleeding wound. Then use a plastic rod to tighten it until the bleeding stops. Once applied, the patient should be taken to the hospital and their tourniquet removed by medical personnel only. Make sure you call 911 first. For more information and instructional videos, please visit these websites. You can save a life by learning how to stop the bleed. CBS cares. I kind of love that commercial. Um, I wish all my doctors were that attractive, but anyway, um, it was a good commercial. It did get the awareness out and they did use this on their sets um, when they were doing that show. It basically, so like I said, this came from the Boston Marathon and what happened was EMS responded to this huge bombing incident and there were patients all over and there were lots of well-meaning citizens and, and bystanders who ran over to help and they ripped off their t-shirts and they ripped off their belts and whatever they had and they tried to stop the bleed and they put these, um, you know, kind of funky tourniquets on everyone and EMS saw those and trusted them and brought patients in and what they found is that there was about a zero percent rate of control of bleeding by the time these patients hit the ER. And that was a huge wake up call in all of the hospitals there. So Homeland Security was involved with that. Obviously, they started this program with um, Health and Human Services. And so now we have the Stop the Bleed program, trying to just make bystanders more aware of what an appropriate tourniquet is. I personally think it's kind of tough to have this thing in your car and actually be in a place where you can use it. But if you see a kit somewhere, you know, we just know that the bystanders are going to be the first ones to resuscitate the patients, not paramedics. So we're just encouraging people to take this class and know what they're doing. Massive transfusion protocols, you probably have one at um, one of your hospitals at least. Basically, this means that we're trying to minimize those fluids, the IV fluids that I talked about, get blood in the patient right away, try to keep them from getting hypotensive using a lot more TXA, which I'm sure you guys are probably using. Remember to only use TXA if, um, within three hours of injury. Yep. Past that, it's not going to help you and actually might hurt you. In children, it's 15 milligrams per kilo over 10 minutes and then two milligrams per kilo per hour until the bleeding stops. We recently decided in um, our institution at Reno for the adults to just give that one gram bolus. Usually after that, they're going to be at the hospital pretty quickly, so they're no longer running their drips because they felt, found that they're wasting a lot of TXA. So I don't know if you guys are having that conversation, but we've gone to the one gram bolus in the field and then just get to the hospital as fast as you can and let us know how much you gave and we might repeat it or stop that, stop the drip as needed. The massive transfusion protocol, the MTP, make sure that there's a red box when the patient hits the ED. So when you call ahead and you have a wait or what's going on, 
the red box will be waiting and basically it's a one to one to one recommendation. So in that box is PRBCs, FFP and platelets. For kids, if you call ahead and you know the weight of the child, we're going to get 25 per kilo of reds, 20 cc's per kilo of FFP and 10 per kilo of platelets ready in that in that red box. And it'll be available again, not cross matched or anything like that. But if blood loss is greater than 30 cc's per kilo, we want to get some blood in them right away. We're going to have that red box ready for you. We want to get their hemoglobins over seven in kids. That's our goal. If they're at seven or above, we're not going to transfuse anymore past that. Quickly moving on to a couple other hot topics. Um, head injury management. Feel your fontanelles. Remember the dub brain for disability. So look at those pupils. Make sure they're not unequal. Anything that's concerning that goose egg is concerning to me. That bulging fontanelle on the left is concerning to me. You can't see that one. Um, abnormal pupils. Again, remember head of bed up a little bit, not hyperventilation, but keep your PCO2 in the 30s preferably. Don't overdo it. Um, we have just as much morbidity and mortality if you blow your PCO2 down too far. They did a big study in Seattle where the patients were hitting the, at Harborview, they were hitting the ED doors with PCO2s in the teens, and those patients had worse outcomes because now they're, you know, completely vasoconstricted and they get ischemic, ischemia of their brains. So you want to keep them in the 30s if you've got your entitled monitoring going um, and bring them into us and we're going to CT them pretty quickly. There are organizations like PCARN, which is doing high quality research in pediatric emergency care. Um, they've come up with ALARA guidelines. ALARA is as low as reasonably achievable. So we're decreasing the radiation that we give the kids and coming up with better guidelines for when to CT and when not to. Remember to do a GCS, even if they're an infant or a child, there is a GCS score for both of them. And again, back to vocabulary, if you call me from the rig and you say, I have a kid that looks like crap, isn't doing what he should do, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me, I have no idea what you're saying. But if you say, I have a child with respiratory failure who has a GCS of eight, that tells me what to get ready when you get to me. So just know that you can do a GCS in an infant and a child, as well as in an adult. For the first 24 hours, as I mentioned, for traumatic brain injury, keeping that head up, keeping the head midline, we use a lot of hyperosmolar therapy, which is 3% saline. We push their sodiums between 150 and 160 is my goals. We're keeping their cerebral perfusion pressure up using volume support to push the pressure, the blood pressure to their brain up um, adequately. And that's a pressure above their mean arterial pressure. So if their mean arterial pressure for an adult, if their mean arterial pressure is 50, you're going to have to push it up another 10 or 20 to get you over that 60 needed in adults. For kids, we think the number is somewhere between 40 and 50. We're doing more research on this, um, but we just don't want it, to, and we don't really know, but we just don't want it to be too low. So we are trying to push closer to that 50 to 60 range. We're giving everyone Keppra to decrease seizure risk. We're giving them sedation analgesia. Or maintaining their vent appropriately to decrease their mean airway pressure so they're not putting more pressure on their heart. We're getting feeds going right away and then we're putting in an ICP monitor if their GCS is less than nine after resuscitation. I have this list here because these are basically, I think I have it here, um, these are basically what we know to be true as far as research goes. So there's not a lot of research in TBI, but those are the things that we know help. We know the PCO2 helps, we know avoiding hypoxia, hypotension, helps. We know getting that CPP, that cerebral perfusion up over 40 at least helps and keeping the ICP under 20. And there's some references if you want to look into the kid TBI thing. Vavala, so Monica Vavala at Harborview in Seattle has published on this and Pat Kachanik has published on this. And again, not a lot of research in kids, but these things we know to be true. Abdominal injury quickly. Um, it used to be if you fell out of a tree and broke your spleen, we took it out. Um, we don't do that anymore. So 80 to 90 percent of all trauma centers now are not taking out spleens, just so you know. Um, we try to keep it in because if you do take it out, they're going to be at risk for infection for the rest of their lives. If you do take out that spleen, they're going to need lots of shots and they're going to need frequent boosters. So it's better to keep your spleen. We found that most of the time if you make them MPO, lay them in bed, don't let them get up, keep them MPO for a day or two, that spleen will seal up, that clot will form, and they will not need to have it out. We are watching their hemoglobin very closely while they're in the hospital, making sure it doesn't drop too low, and doing whatever we can to not take out their spleens or livers. Those are my little liver transplant kids, just examples of what those scars look like. Airbag injury, quickly. 
So I like the picture up in the right. I, I use this to point out to people how much bigger um, proportionally the head is in a newborn versus an adult. So they've basically got this giant boulder on their shoulders and that's why they get those ligamentous injuries and those high spinal cord injuries because they just have this huge thing that's going to move forward and back when they're hit from behind in a car accident, for instance. So it's super important to keep those kids in car seats. But the, the other important thing is to not let them be in the front seat. If you have you know, a toddler or a small child in the front seat, that airbag is going to come at them high velocity and potentially hurt them. Um, their head is huge and big. It's going to go toward that airbag pretty quickly and probably cause more damage from them than it does from an adult. So going down that list, an airbag can reach speeds of 250 miles per hour. If you add to it that that kid is not in a seatbelt, you are just asking for trouble. So put them in the back seat. The middle seat, by the way, is the most um, is the safest seat. If you didn't know this, in the back seat, if you have a kid or a baby, put them in the middle. Um, as you know, or if you don't, um, drivers tend to steer away from themselves in an accident, so they preserve themselves by steering away from a threat. So if your child is behind you, that is also behind the driver, that is also a safe place to be, but the middle seat is less likely, they're less likely to get crushed by the driver of the passenger seat. Um, so put them in the back middle seat. Um, and if they're less than 13 years of age, keep them in the back seat. We did redesign cars, by the way. So if you have a car that's after, or sorry, airbags, if you have a car that was uh, born after 1998, um, they took out the gas generating propellant, so people aren't catching on fire as much as they used to be. But if you have an older car before 1998, just keep that in mind. If you can get your airbags switched out, might not be the worst idea. Uh, so Dr. Keppel, you had mentioned to me that somebody in your group wanted to hear a little bit about encephalopathy in DKA. So while I'm talking about brain injury, I'll just bring this up um, if it's a question that anyone has out there. When we're talking about patients with DKA, when I get a call from outside, um, what I want to know more than anything is their pH. And just doing a quick blood gas tells me a lot about that patient. The glucose level is actually not as important. The glucose level tells you about their hydration status. So a glucose of 800, 900, they're just super dehydrated. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're acidotic. If their pH is 6.8, 6.9, 7, that's an acidotic patient. Um, but what I mean, what I'm, I'm bringing that up because I don't overdo fluids. Even if the glucose is high, I need to be careful um, because with that acidosis, I need to be able to give insulin. And if you hydrate them, you're going to drop their glucose really quickly. So again, that glucose is based on their hydration status. And if you give them a whole bunch of fluid, if you give them two liters of fluid, you're going to drop their glucose from 500 to 200. And if I'm trying to run insulin, the next thing I know, I'm going to have to turn off that insulin. In the meantime, I have not fixed their acidosis. I've not fixed their pH. I haven't given them the insulin that they need. So my personal protocol is to give 10 cc's per kilo in a fluid bolus, and then I ask my paramedics, to run normal saline at one and a half times maintenance, and that's it. And depending on how far they are away from me, I might start insulin. If I do, it's 0.1 units per kilo per hour, watching that glucose every 15 minutes to half an hour during the trip. Otherwise, I'm starting it as soon as they get to the hospital, um, but not overdoing it. That gives me room to continue to run that insulin all night, and make them better. Now you can have DKA with or without coma. Um, I don't want you to be over concerned about encephalopathy and DKA. These patients come in completely obtunded, you know, speaking in tongues, mumbling things. As long as you're correcting their acidosis, that coma will improve. So we don't do anything crazy for the coma piece of this. There's been no data that shows it helps to um, do ICP precautions even. They're probably not going to have a lot of brain swelling beforehand. The brain swelling that we worry about, cerebral edema and DKA, happens about 24 to 48 hours after starting insulin. So the more important part is once they get to us, not overdoing it with the fluids and doing an appropriate protocol. And what we've seen is with our appropriate protocols and decreased fluids, we've actually decreased cerebral edema below 5%. So we have a much um, lower mortality and DKA from cerebral edema. And again, what you're seeing in the field, that encephalopathy that you're seeing, that's just because of the acidosis and they're so dehydrated. That's not necessarily cerebral edema. So don't worry too, too much about that. You can follow your general ICP precautions. You can give a bolus of 3% saline if you're really worried, if they're very comatose. But basically, you're going to do the same thing as far as giving them a little bit of fluid and getting that insulin started. And we usually see that coma turn around within about 12 hours. Dr. Dieter? Yes. 
Hey, um, we have about five minutes left and yeah. um, wondering if we could move to a quick Q&A. We can. Let me just point this out. This is my last couple of slides. Yeah. Happy to ask questions. I just want to point out for you guys, you can look at these trauma maps in the University of Pennsylvania. Um, the purple is, sorry, let me start with this. The blue dots are pediatric trauma centers. So just so you're aware of that. Blue dots are all the pediatric trauma centers or national children's hospitals that we have available. And the purple dots around them are areas within 60 minutes by ambulance or by copter. So those kids can get to that pediatric trauma center within 60 minutes if you're in that dark purple range. The gray areas are areas of concentration of children less than 14 years of age. So you can see we have huge areas of our country, especially out here in the West, where we don't have trauma services immediately available, and yet we have tons of kids. So it's just something I'm asking you guys to be aware of. Here's you, here's me over here. Um, just know where your pediatric trauma centers are and know how to you know, do what you can to help me out to help boost you know, Mercy and Shasta Regional and all these great hospitals out there, boost their pediatric trauma capability because you're very far away from pediatric trauma center. So you're gonna have to do a lot of it on your own. Okay, that's what I got for you. Thank you so much. I'm happy to take questions. Uh, hit me with what you got. Okay. Wow. Thanks so much. That was, that was packed and um, really clear. Um, and it was so clear that actually we're, I'm not seeing a whole bunch of uh, <laughs> questions in the, in the Q&A, but I actually have a couple of my own. Sure. Um, and others can feel free to chime in. We've had about 63 people on, the, on this conference. So really appreciate everybody being here and there will be more. Um, issues like decreased, decreasing the amount of fluids that we're giving in trauma, uh, DKA, things that have, are evolving, changing. Um, if you were to say just a couple of things for pre-hospital personnel that you see not consistently being done the way that you would like to have them done, what would be a few of those things? Appreciate that question. So what we're realizing is we used to um, be huge proponents of early and aggressive fluid resuscitation. And again, it all sounded good at the time. We pushed the blood pressure up, the patient looked better. But what we found when we follow these patients out while they're in the ICU and then afterward or to discharge is there's actually a higher rate of morbidity and mortality with the higher amount of fluids that you give. And that's because of the fluid overload. And the fluid overload leads to ARDS, leads to renal failure. And now you have a patient that's not, you know, that survived their first 24 hours, but they might not survive um, their hospital stay, if that makes sense. And in really looking at that, what we've realized is you just need to give enough fluid. So just enough to correct the blood pressure, for instance, or in a child for an adult to correct the blood pressure but in a kid to improve the tachycardia. So again, the kid's probably not gonna be hypotensive, so you're not gonna have a goal there. Their blood pressure is gonna look okay, but they might be dry lips, sunken fontanelle, and heart rate of 180. And if you can give a 10 cc per kilo or 20 cc per kilo fluid bolus and bring their heart rate down to let's say 160 or 140, you've done a good job and you might be okay right there. If you see urine output, you've done a perfect job and you don't wanna push any any further past that with the excessive fluid. So at that point, I just run normal saline. If it's a baby, I'll run a little D5, D5 half normal or D5 normal saline, um, just at maintenance and get them to us. And then we can do the rest of the, the fluid resuscitation. The other thing I just see in the field sometimes is just a little overdoing it. So patient, a baby having seizures gets a five milligram um, IM Versed hit. They're still seizing to get another five milligrams. So again, the only big thing I ask with the kids is just know what your doses are per kilo and use that Braslow card to get an estimate of their kilograms and give appropriate medication. Because if you give that baby 10 milligrams of Versed, the next thing you're gonna be doing is intubating them. So I encourage you to just be aware of that. Those are my only two big feedback things that I see frequently. Great, thanks so much, that's super helpful. Well, we'd love to have you back and um, thanks for all of you who have hung on for this whole hour. And I think we did it without any significant technical glitches. So um, that's actually a miracle. So um, Dr. Jeter, thank you so much. And we'll have you back. Excellent. Thank you guys again for everything you do. And uh, let me know if you have any questions, comments. I'm kdeter at renown.org. Happy to take any further questions or concerns. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks a bunch.